everybody uh, for being here today. My name is Wes Anderson. I'm a PhD student at UF uh, in the Rangeland Wildlife and Ecosystems Program. And today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work that we're doing, how we got to where we are, and it's kind of been a long process, but uh, I think we're making good progress now. All right, uh, so just a little bit of background on drone technology. So Nikola Tesla, if you've heard of him before, very famous scientist, maybe not so much so as Edison, but he's been known as the father of unmanned vehicle technology. Uh, essentially, he was the first person that submitted a patent for what, you know, came to, what, what is an unmanned vehicle. So uh, I guess in his case, it was a radio controlled boat. But an unmanned aircraft has been used uh, at least since the mid 1800s, uh, in this case for military operations. Uh, I guess first they used uh, unmanned balloons that they flew over there to drop bombs. But then once we got to World War I, that's when kind of the precursor of the, the drone that we know of today came about. And by the Cold War, you know, we had all these drones flying around, uh, doing surveillance. It wasn't until I believe the early 2000s that we got the Predator drones that actually had the uh, Hellfire missiles attached to them. So that's what everybody thinks about when you, you, know, when you hear drone for the most part. Uh, but since 2013, drone technology has advanced rapidly. I mean, we started back in Bethany 2014, I think. And uh, I mean, just what we're able to buy today compared to what we were able to buy back then, it's, it's incredible. So there are two main types of platforms when we're talking about drones. So what we're using uh, is this rotor style drone on the, uh, the right here. And uh, that's good for a lot of reasons. Technically cheaper, or it's uh, typically cheaper. There's a better accuracy and resolution because you're able to stay in one area if you want to. Uh, shorter, but it does have shorter flight times. Um, there's stable and high resolution images and with the gimbal, which is what allows the camera to turn around, you're able to take pictures from multiple angles. Uh, now, a lot of people, and especially if they're covering a large area, they're gonna use these uh, fixed wing drones here. Uh, it allows for longer flight time. Because of the speed that's traveling out, there can be some blur. Um, and you're also, because it doesn't have a gimbal, you can only take uh, video, or images and videos from uh, straight down from NIDAR. All right, so there are lots of different sensors uh, when we're talking about drones, and the sensor that you pick is gonna be based off of what your research aims are. Uh, in our case, we're just using, uh, I guess, red, green, blue, or what is known as visual light. So that would be this right here, and you can just do it for regular mapping. We're using it for our damage analyses. Uh, if you get a thermal sensor, you can obviously pick up thermal imagery. Uh, it can be used for heat stress, uh, looking at how uh, plants are metabolizing things. Uh, multispectral. So when we're talking about visual light, we're just talking about three bands, red, green, and blue. But multispectral can include other things like near infrared. So multispectral is typically three to ten bands, and you can look at other things, uh, create NDVI indices, uh, look at nutrient deficiencies, look at pest damage. And there's also LIDAR. Uh, you can use LIDAR to measure distance and, and elevations, and from that you can create topographical maps. Uh, finally, there's hyperspectral, which when you're thinking about hyperspectral, think of it kind of just as multispectral, but the bands are a lot shorter and there are a lot more. So you're pretty much doing what you're doing with multispectral, just at a much finer resolution. Uh, here are some links at the bottom, and you all have the handout, so if you want to check out any of those, there's some good resources. Uh, so the uh, the drone that we're using is the DJI Phantom 4. DJI is a very common company for people to go with uh, if they are doing drone research. So the one that John has over there, I believe, is the Mavic. Yeah, the Mavic Pro. Yeah, so the, um, the DJI Phantom 4 it might be two, three times that size. Uh, it's very easy to fly. Um, I can either put it in manual mode or I can you know, set it on its own path and it'll, it'll go on its way. Uh, it has about 20 minutes of battery life, uh, which is pretty good for what we need to do. Uh, it's nice because the apps that we use to fly it, uh, they're, you know, they're very easy to use. They're very user friendly. Um, it's got a built in first person view so I can see exactly what the drone's seeing at that time, wherever the, the camera's pointed at. And to get us started, uh, with a setup like this, it's around $1,200. All right. So the DJI Go app is what we use for manual flights. So if I just want to take the drone out, I'm going to take it around and take some pictures or video. I'm going to open up this uh, app right on the iPad or iPhone. Uh, there are multiple flight modes that I can use. I can have it you know, just follow me around. I can uh, set it on a course and have it go in that direction. I can send it to a waypoint or a point of interest. There's also a live video feed, so I can see exactly what's going on as I'm flying it around. 
Uh, so for our research, we're using MapPilot for DJI. And uh, this allows us to select our study areas. We'll plan out the whole mission. So we'll load the, uh, the satellite imagery of where we want to fly. So uh, you know, we'll go out to an area. We'll see it. We want to fly this area. We'll just draw a polygon around it. That'll set a path that zigzags across the screen within the study area. From there, we can set how fast we want it to fly, what altitude we want it at, and, um, and also the amount of overlap. So when it's taking a picture side by side or in different lines, how much those pictures are going to overlap. Uh, it gives us a live feed of how the mission's progressing. And once it's finished with the mission, it'll automatically return home to you know, where we launched it from. Now, you got to keep in mind, it, it'll come down, but maybe not in the exact area. So at that point, you got to take it over. you got to bring it down safely and land it yourself. Uh, so what I'll be talking about later, some of the pastures, those are 40 acres. So you can't fly you know, it in one single go with the battery because it's only about 20 minutes long. So those are about 35-minute flights. So a little bit uh, past halfway in the mission, I'll stop it. I'll bring it back. I'll change out the battery. And then through the uh, map pilot app, it'll go back directly to where it stopped. <clears throat> All right, so for, I guess I'll discuss our data pipeline now, how we go from this drone to, you know, some analyses of damage on the ground. Uh, so we're creating mosaics from raw imagery. Uh, we use uh, something called Maps Made Easy. So we take all these pictures uh, that we have of our study site, we upload them, and then it's going to compile them into a single mosaic or one picture. Uh, with each picture, there is a, a GPS uh, EXIF tag, so it's already kind of geo-referenced. We know where those pictures came from, and it uses that to stitch everything together. Uh, there is a cost to it, however. Um, I guess for less than 100 images, it's free, which is great for my study wetlands. Uh, for the larger pastures, it's 0 0.015 cents per image, or 38 cents per acre. Uh, there are a lot of other options, though. Uh, John touched briefly on drone deploy. There's the PIX40 mapper and um, also ArcGIS drone map software. So really, you just got to go out there and you got to look at your options, see what's most uh, cost effective and you know what, what's going to get the job done. But right here is an overlap report. So we can see, so each dot right there is a picture in this mosaic. And we can see uh, the blue means that there's a lot of overlap, the red slightly less so. So we want it to a degree of overlap where it's able to mosaic the image. If there's not enough overlap, then it's not going to mosaic it at all. So typically for uh, pastures, at least where they're wide open, 70% is uh, sufficient. With the wetlands, we do it at 75% overlap just because uh, they're smaller. We can do most of them for free anyway. All right, so a lot of our research is focused at Buck Island Ranch, which is over in Highlands County. Uh, it's a 10,000 plus acre cattle ranch uh, administered by Archibald Biological Station. And so we're looking at how pigs are damaging both pastures and wetlands. So as most of you know, pigs, they get into the ground, they root up the soil. Uh, that can create a lot of problems. It can uh, lower the, uh, the forage quality for the cattle. It can also disturb sensitive habitat. And wetlands are really important wildlife habitat. So if they're uh, damaging the vegetation or the soils or the hydrology, uh, we want to be able to, you know, I guess, uh, measure the extent of that. Uh, so we've got 24 or 25 40-acre pastures all throughout the ranch. Uh, we also have 36 wetlands. Uh, those range in about one acre to three acres in size. And uh, just have you know, so in the middle right here, that's more improved pasture, whereas in the east, the west, and the south, that's semi-native pasture. So they're kind of two different habitat types. The improved pasture is planted in bahia grass. Uh, there's not really that much growing, whereas that much else growing. Whereas in the um, semi-native pasture, we've got more native plant species, uh, typically less ditches as well, or fewer ditches. All right, um, so what we're going to do with those uh, 25 pastures, 36 wetlands, we're going to fly them four times a year during the uh, dry season, and we're going to collect aerial images with the drone and create mosaics. Uh, because we're measuring these uh, areas over time, we want them to be able to line up uh, very exactly. So we also have ground control points right there. So I've put all these... Uh, one foot by one foot boards out, they've got an X on them, and from there we can see them in the mosaic somewhere, you know, they're at a known location. So we're able to better correct and geo-reference our images. All right, so from there, once we have the mosaic, 
we're going to use ArcGIS, which is a mapping software that's very common, uh, to do some analyses. What, what it is is a maximum likelihood analysis. But what we're trying to do here is train the program to recognize which areas are rooted by the pigs and which are not rooted. So you see here, got some blue polygons that I'm defining as non-rooted areas. You can pretty clearly see, you know, this whole section right here is rooted. So I got a polygon there, I got a polygon there, there's some rooting over there. So I've defined a subset of this whole picture. And from there, I'm going to run analysis and it's going to tell me which areas are rooted and which areas are not. And so there, there are a lot of steps in the middle there where you need to go through and do some quality control and uh, quality assurance. But in the end, it come out with something like this. So we've got rooting over here in the west, got rooting over here in the east. And from there, I'm able to calculate that 2.3% you know, of this entire wetland has been rooted. And so we'll go back over time and uh, be able to see how that's changed. Uh, so there are a few things that I wanted to look at, or that we wanted to look at. Uh, one is, was the difference in rooting between the north and the south wetlands different? Uh, because in fall 2016, we removed 95 pigs from the south, so we removed a lot of those pigs uh, south of the Harney Pond Canal. I want to see throughout the dry season then, was there a difference in the rooting? And also we want to see, is there a difference in the rooting damage wetlands between improved and semi-native pasture? So the, um, the vegetation that's in those wetlands is different between the two pastures, and you know, maybe pigs prefer one over the other. Uh, so for the 2016-2017 uh, dry season, we uh, analyzed uh, all the flights from 11 wetlands in the south, which are all semi-native, uh, and 10 wetlands in the north. And five of those were improved and five were inseminated. So you got to bear in mind this is a very small sample size at this point. It takes a long time to get through these analyses. We actually have somebody helping us right now. Um, but this is just some preliminary data. All right. So some of our preliminary results, uh, the north rooting increased over time. So the blue right here is north. The orange right here is south. You can see by May, that's when we had the highest amount of rooting that we were able to detect in our wetlands. Whereas with the south, we we're only really able to detect rooting in, uh, in January and March. And it, even though it's a small sample size, you know, we, we did get a decent amount of rooting in, uh, in the northern areas. So that's saying, you know, as, a, as a result of our hog control and removal efforts, you know, that, that did make a difference in, uh, in how bad that they were rooting up the southern wetlands. All right. Um, well, this is this is pretty much the same, but so 194 meters squared was the average area in northern wetlands, whereas only six meters squared rooted was the average in the southern wetlands. There's a decent difference there. Uh, also, looking at between improved and semi-native, so improved wetlands, and and this is all in the north, had a 283 meters squared worth of damage, whereas uh, in the south there was an average of 38 meters squared, and so you know the the results weren't significant, but we're, you know, we got a lot more to analyze. And it's kind of suggesting that there's a trend that they're rooting more in improved pasture. Uh, one thing that we might be able to look at is we're working on a diet study right now. We collected hog uh, scat for a year and we did some DNA analyses on that. So maybe we'll be able to tease out, well, why are they rooting more in these improved pastures? It could be the vegetation that's there or maybe some of the animals that are more common in those areas. And so there, there's a lot more that we're going to do. Um, so we, we do a lot of trapping and tagging of our pigs. Uh, we put GPS collars on them so we know where they're going. We also have a game camera array of uh, 43? 43 or 44? 44. 44 game cameras uh, throughout this 10,000 uh, acre ranch. So what we'll be able to do with those game cameras, because our pigs are tagged, we'll be able to uh, know what the density of pigs are in each uh, kilometer square of the ranch. And then we'll be able to see, well, you know, the density of pigs was X amount here. This is how much rooting is in the area. So see what the correlation between the, the amount of pigs or the density of pigs and the amount of damage is. And uh, so we, we're still working on pasture imagery analyses. Uh, we're also going to be able to compare our wetland uh, damage against our pasture damage, see if those are occurring at the same time, or maybe, you know, the hogs are rooting in the pastures at one point in time and then switching to wetlands. Uh, so as part of my dissertation research, I spend a lot of time in the wetlands. It's kind of nice not to be in uh, hip waders today. It's very hot. But uh, examining the impacts on wetland fauna. So this is a, 
a siren right here. Large aquatic salamanders, uh, very common in the region. Most people don't see them, but they, uh, they dig underneath the soil when it's dry out. So that's when the hogs are getting into the wetlands. There are these salamanders underneath, and one of the things they might be eating, and we, we know that from our, our diet analyses, is sirens. So is the amount of damage that's occurring in these wetlands impacting which species occur there? Um, also, you know, it's not just pigs going in and eating the animals, they're overwintering in the wetlands, but it's also just the damage itself. So they're, they're changing the vegetation structure, they're changing the uh, water quality, things like that. So the tadpoles that are growing up there this summer, are they doing worse in wetlands that have a lot of rooting in them? So that's something I'm trying to look at more right now. All right, so there are other projects that we're doing. So the, the uh, pig damage over at Buck Island, that's kind of the main one, but we've got other projects going as well. Uh, one of them is looking at how uh, prescribed burns here uh, at the range cattle wreck are impacting a canopy cover and gap development. So when we do a burn, we're, what we want to see is a, a decrease in the uh, amount of woody vegetation and then an increase in forage cover for cattle. So we're doing flights before the burns, doing flights after the burns, and then we're able to measure these gaps that are developing. And we want to look at that from one, uh, you know, a cattle perspective. Is the forage increasing? You know, is that better for cattle to do these burns? But also from a wildlife perspective. So uh, important game species like bobwhite quail, are they responding better to these uh, gaps that are developing? And, uh, so that's an overview of the projects that we're doing right now. Uh, just how we got here, our first drone was a 3DR X8. It was uh, a little bit more clunky than the, uh, the Phantom 4. It was a little scary to fly. The controls weren't nearly as smooth as the, as the Phantom 4. Um, but here's just a picture of one of the first mosaics we ever did. Um, but it, it's just great how, how much over the past few years the, uh, the technology has increased and the price has dropped because it's made it very manageable for us to uh, pursue these research questions that we're really interested in. Uh, one of the biggest constraints that we've run up against is data storage. Uh, so, you know, after three years of data collection, we're up to four terabytes worth of data. And it's just, you know, it's, it, I know the data costs are down or data storage costs are down, but, you know, not just storing them, but when we're mosaicing them, we have to upload everything to the internet as well. Uh, so that might be an advantage of other software that you don't need to do that. So keep that in mind. All right, well now that's the end of my talk. Turn it over to Vivian. Hi guys, uh, I'm Vivian. I'm from Archibald Biological Station, and uh, this is a presentation that uh, Kevin Main, who is here, um, our land manager, and I put together. Uh, almost two years ago at this point, so there have been some changes that I'll kind of highlight along the way as we go as to what we do. So we're um, at Archbold, we do a lot of prescribed fires for managing our scrub habitat there, and so we have been trying to map these <laughs> for a very long time, and obviously drones have made this a lot easier. Um, so you can see in this initial image, we used to fly in a, in a little ultralight plane and uh, lean over the edge and take photographs, um, and now we have this drone technology. So we'll kind of talk about how we move through that and challenges we've had along the way. So when you're leaning out the side of a small plane taking photographs, it's really, really hard to get them pointed down. It's really, really hard to get a lot of overlap in the images so that you can uh, stitch them together. It's also expensive, so you want to wait until you have a fair amount of uh, prescribed fires done so you can go and get photos um, you know, in one flight of a bunch of different units. And so this means that we have to wait and there's probably resprouting that's happening so we're not getting an accurate assessment of our prescribed fires by doing that but it was the only option that we had and when did we start doing that Kevin the late 70s or something like that a really long time um, and you know before software was really <coughs> good for us to be able to stitch images together they were looking at individual images and kind of drawing on a map where the different intensities of the fires were happening um, and once we were able to stitch some of the images together, we would get an image that would look like this, and you can kind of see 
the uh, you know obliqueness on the side here. It's not perfect put together, um, but you can see how you know Kevin actually is trying to map where the intensity of the fire is, where it burned, where it didn't burn, and how intense and hot the fire was based on the charring on the ground um, and his knowledge as the land manager. But now we have a drone and we have the DJI Phantom 4 Pro. So just the next one after Wes um, and Bethany are using. So images straight down, obviously. Um, and we go up and we fly the fire, preferably the day after. Um, so we do this for um, all the fires that happen on our sites. And we've also been contracted by Florida Fish and Wildlife to fly their fi prescribed fires on the Lake Wales Ridge um, in the Southern portion. So, um, you know, all the positives of using the drone faster, higher accuracy, no oblique images anymore, all of this kind of stuff are really, really huge benefits for us. Um, so the software that we're using to actually stitch everything together is drone to map which is an ArcGIS product made by Esri. Um, they're now up to version 1.3, so it looks a little bit different to this, but not too much. So I'm kind of going to go through the steps of what it is like to use this software. Um, Wes kind of talked about some pros and cons of using a cloud-based software, you know, where you're uploading pictures to the web. We actually use Maps Made Easy for a while before we got this software. Um, so I really like having it, um, but, you know, there are some drawbacks as well. And the main drawback is that, is that you need to have a really powerful computer to be able to do this. Um, and you should not be expecting to do anything else on your computer while it is t taking the lots of hours that it will take to process this kind of imagery. So, you know, we're kind of at a point where we're buying a server, you know, with a huge ton of storage on it so we can have this software on the server so we can do the processing and store all of the imagery there as well. So, um, kind of going along uh, the path of similar things that, uh, problems that Wes was talking about, but, um, so I really like having the, the project um, on a computer and I feel like there's a lot more functionality and ability for me to make changes than some of the cloud um, software ones that I've used before. Um, so you can go in and you know put all of your individual images, it tells you your height and your X and Y and all that kind of stuff at the beginning. Um, and so this was actually flown uh, two years ago and at this point we didn't have our own drone and we had a contractor, Jen Brown, who some of you may know who was flying for us. And it was also before the softwares that allowed the automatic flight paths had come out. So that's why these lines look kind of crazy. Now if we fly it, it would look very, you know, very uh, perfect lines with the appropriate overlap and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, the thing that proved to be difficult was that um, was getting the appropriate amount of overlap without that automated flight plan. And so, you know, you, you can see I had her fly up and down every line twice so that she would get enough overlap between some of the images. So, you know, future ones look a lot better and we don't have as many challenges and don't end up with some as, as many gaps. Um, you can also, so all the dots are where all the images are, and you can actually click on the dots and see the images. You can disable them. Um, this is kind of what the, the final product would look like once it's been stitched together. And you can see that it does a pretty good job with the georeferencing, um, but not perfect. Most of those, you know, fire lanes are the areas that you can see that line up really well. Some of them don't line up perfectly, like right there. Um, so that would be the reason to use the ground control points. Um, for this study, it's not as important to use the ground control points because we're not looking at changes over time. We're trying to map the fire, and so it's a very static in time. But other studies that we're working on, we're going to be using ground control points. Um, so you can click on the images. You can look what they look like individually. Um, um, it also will produce this uh, digital surface model, which I like a lot, and digital elevation model. Um, and it does have the ability to make a 3D textured mesh, um, so we are, which can then be added to ArcScene, which is another ArcGIS product. So, um, and this you can actually grab it and sort of twist it and move it around and things like that. So we have ideas to do, you know, more canopy density types of studies for scrub jay habitat and things like that are ideas that we have. So, um, you know, this is kind of showing the uh, the different things that it can do. Um, so, you know, right away, the orthomosaic and the digital surface model are great. Um, but you can see along in the NDVI, we haven't played around with that yet, but that will be coming soon. So I'm glad that the software can handle that. 
Um, and it looks like you just kind of specify which sensor, which band is your red band and which band is your near infrared band. Um, but on the bottom are those 3D products that it can make. And so a lot of people will use it for, you know, this inspection type of thing, or they'll go around a building at different heights, pointing in at different angles so that they can actually get this 3D model and build what it looks like. So, you know, of course, our scrunchy scientists really want to do that type of stuff with canopy work, but we haven't gotten that far yet. So that'll, that will be um, the next step for us. So... Um, so here is this stitched together image of these uh, few fires that we did here and I'm kind of going to flip back and forth between this slide and the next slide, which is the mapping, the intensity of it. So um, this is something that Kevin will manually do after every fire, again based on the charring on the ground, but also based on his knowledge of how the fire moved as the burn boss. If I flip back and forth, you can kind of see some of the areas, you know, why he mapped things certain ways and, and things like that. So um, now that we've got this really, really accurate imagery, and, but we've been doing this since the late 70s, we kind of have to, to make some assumptions and make some decisions about what we want to do. So if we couldn't get the accuracy so incredibly perfect in the 70s, and this is now a long-term study, how accurate do we actually want to get with the mapping that we can do? Because we can get it really, really accurate now, but we, you know, we want to balance time and resources, um, and also you know, having the study not have too much of a change in terms of the accuracy that we have. So you know, ultimately what we do with this fire intensity data is we put a five meter by five meter grid over all of it, and we have that for all of Archbold um, that we can then query out to be able to get information that we need about you know, anything that we have gridded. Um, but time since fire is the main one that people will use that grid for. So we kind of made that assumption that, you know, if we can map it within a five meter accuracy, that would be good enough because that would be consistent with the study. But, you know, I think he can attest to it. You could probably spend hours and hours and hours staring at this and mapping out every single tree that is a little bit green on the top. And, you know, so we had to, had to find that balance along that. So um, I did want to talk about a couple other projects that we are starting to work on now. I don't have any slides for them, um, but you know, one of the, we're also um, flying at Buck Island Ranch a lot as well, and uh, one of the projects that we're working on is trying to identify smut grass from um, drone imagery. So we're flying over that consistently and, um, you know, working with different classification methods to see if we can pull out where the smut grass is. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing. Another thing that we're doing is um, looking at uh, wetland community, plant community response to, ch uh, to fire. So we flew before a fire, after a fire, and now a year after a fire as well. And we're trying to um, classify the plant communities, which is a little bit harder. So you have to fly a little bit lower to be able to identify plant species and things like that. Um, so we're working on that one as well. Um, and then all these other ideas of things keep popping up and we're realizing that, you know, Kevin and I are the only people with the, with the pilot license um, at Archbold and there's only so many hours in a day that we can get things done. So we're having to prioritize or try and figure out um, what we need to, not what we need to be doing next. 